Hello everyone. Welcome back to VOKK's third TV series to rediscovering and preserving the Kamaikrom identity. I am Virginia Tatch and I welcome you to take some time to continue to watch this video on our next important topics, involvement in the community, the census, and most importantly, voting. As you already know, this year in particular, the people in the United States have two significant opportunities. They can participate in responding to the census that have been circulating in the mail or online and also have the right to exercise their right to vote in the primary election, which is just a couple of weeks away. For those viewers who are not familiar with the census, the census takes place every 10 years According to census.gov, the data collected by the census determine the number of seats each state has in the U.S. House of Representatives and is also used to distribute billions in federal funds to local communities. As Kamai Karam living in the United States, we need to take the opportunities presented to us and use our right to vote, which are rights that our voiceless Kamai Karam people in Kampuchea Karam do not have. Taking the, this opportunity, I would like to invite one of KKF's youth committee leaders, Mr. Don Lam, to answer a couple of questions regarding his volunteer work in his local community and answer questions regarding the U.S. Census and registering to vote. Hello, Don. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Virginia? I'm doing great. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear from you. So I wanted to take you... Thank you for taking some time out of your day, as I do know that you are busy with work and helping out with your local community. Um, so let's first start off by letting you know our viewers know who you are and how you are a part of KKFYC. Okay, well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'm excited to be on your program. Uh, thank you for setting this up. It's a, it's a thrill to be on this program for sure. Uh, first time English program run by youth, right? <laughs> Uh, so, the, the, the question is uh, how I am involved with KKFYC, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah. So, I am part of the Khmer Krom, uh, Federation Youth Committee. I've joined uh, the, the program since uh, 2007. Actually, I joined earlier for the first time. Uh, I went to the, our annual UN conference was in 2007. And uh, I've been helping, uh, working on uh, different projects throughout uh, my time there, uh, including helping to revise or helping to edit uh, reports and different shadow reports that we uh, submit to different UN agencies, such as the, um, the periodic review, um, UPR. Uh, we do shadow reports to UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, um, Cultural Belief, uh, and also our annual uh, permanent forum uh, participation intervention speeches. Those are some things that, uh, as as members of KKFYC, we help to do research and write and uh, help create those intervention speeches for our youth. Uh, so we do that every year. Unfortunately, this year, uh, the whole UNPFII has been uh, temporarily uh, out because of COVID-19 and uh, the pandemic situation. Okay, thank you, Don. So you have mentioned that you've been involved with KKFIC for more than a decade to advocate for the Khmer Gnome rights at the United Nations and in, in New York and in Geneva. So can you give some insight on why you think that it's important for the Khmer Gnome to be involved with KKF? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as you know, Khmer Gnome people in our uh, country do not have uh, representation. We do not have a uh, voice the same way that we have voices in here in America. Uh, so for many reasons, having our representation to be, to be consulted on when, for example, when there's a development projects going on in you know, your city, your town, or your local villages, it helps uh, prevent exploitation. It helps uh, keep uh, communities safe. Uh, so, and also it helps uh, communities develop along with the country and not get left behind. So, uh, since we do not have a voice 
back at home and we're not even recognized as indigenous people. It's important for our people, Quebec people, overseas, whether it's in the U.S., Canada, Australia. As you know, you've been a part of our youth team. We have uh, quite a global team uh, from everywhere that helps come up, come together, and and help you know write out research these advocate advocacy issues that are struggling uh, by by that are struggled by our people in, in Quebec Rome who you know, do not, like I said, do not have a voice. So it's important that we bring those voices. Uh, up for them uh, that we become their voices, whether it's at like, you know, our own government agencies like um, State Department or it's at uh, UN uh, special uh, mechanisms like the Expert uh, Review or the Permanent Forum on Indigenous People or the U UPR. Uh, so those are really important places for us to have a voice at, uh, at uh, if we want to be heard. Great, thank you, Don. So in talking about KKFYC, um, we both have met through KKFYC and we've built, you know, a long bonding friendship. Um, so I had the opportunity to attend the UN with you and others. Um, you were, from what I remember, you were very knowledgeable and I do know that um, I had learned so much from you throughout my first year there and you were a good, um, I would say, role model for me to follow and to understand and to learn. So I wanted to see, ever since then, um, like I said, we've kept in contact and I've noticed that you have constantly been advocating on social media um, and you have asked the Khmer Karam people to respond to the census questions by identifying ourselves as Khmer Karam. Could you please tell us why it is crucial to respond to the census and why as Khmer Karam? What outcomes do you think that will provide for us as Khmer Karam indigenous peoples here in America? Yeah, so the the importance of participating in the census uh i think uh, cannot be understated or uh, it's it's really uh one of those things that y you really have to be a part of like i said it's it's a matter of representation wherever you go if you're not counted then you don't have a voice so being able to participate in the census uh gives you uh accounts gives gives your group uh, accounts so that uh, resources are uh, b being distributed uh, equally and fairly and so that uh, you are able to uh, get what you need as a group uh, and it also helps things with like um, uh, discrimination so it, it helps uh, governments to see and identify which you know, segments of populations lack what resources, and uh, it also helps you as as young people like get uh, bilingual services if that's if that's one of the things that you have problems with. Um, and the I think the main distinction between U.S. and, and Vietnam, for example, is that in the U.S. when we do have a census, uh, we have different government agencies and we have local nonprofits and NGOs that go out and help uh, the population understand like what these census are for and and these populations have uh, language specific resources that that help them uh, uh, to get to get an understanding of how to fill out the survey and why it's important and uh, that's 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 a big difference in here in the local nonprofit that I work with, we were able to get like grants and work with other nonprofits in partnership with them. We were able to translate resources as well as um, use the resources that the governments already translate uh, for us uh, from resources of census translation to election translation. You can all find those resources on the government websites. Uh, that's you know quite a contrast to to our situation back home in Kamtia Grom. Um, where you know people might go to uh, ask the villagers about uh, the census, whatever, but the villagers have no idea what the census are because they don't. Most of them, a lot of our villagers still don't speak Vietnamese, right? And so they have no idea what it's for. And so if they don't know what it's for, the data there it's not really not really reliable because in order to have reliable data, you have to have the the people who's, who's filling out the survey understand what they're filling out for. Um, so they're not like coerced or they're not misinformed in, in the options that they're given. Um, 
yeah, so that's, that's why uh, representation is why uh, census is really important. Okay, so connecting our homeland to this topic, can you talk a little bit about the census in our homeland, Cambodia Chrome? For our viewers, Vietnam conducted a census last year, and we all know that the population of Vietnam is more than 96 million people to date. It ranks third in Southeast Asia and 15th in the world. Surprisingly, Vietnam still claims that the Khmer Khan population is still more than a million, which is almost the same number that Vietnam claimed more than 30 years ago. What do you think about the census process that Vietnam used to count the Khmer Khan back in our homeland in Cambodia Khrom? So, like I was saying, um, it's hard to you know, to give credibility to a census that uh, is not well, you know, well formed. Well formed in the meaning that it's it doesn't give the people who who are participating these in these census the ability to understand what these uh, questions are about and why they have to uh, fill them out and what's important to them, why it's important to them. So they don't know. Like in here in America, we know that the census is important because. Uh, it gives us representation and, and therefore it gives us, you know, a portion of the pie in terms of resource. Um, but in Kampche Grub, we don't know that. Uh, the people don't know that. And since the language is not, uh, we don't have the language resource, it's not translated for us, the forms are not translated for us, and there's no uh, NGOs or uh, governments that actually go and educate the people why it's important, then how do we know, like, the people are actually correctly identifying themselves as Khmer Khrom. You already know that even the term Khmer Khrom has been like controversial in our homeland. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, a couple of our youth friends were interrogated and they were asked by police, why you guys have the word Khmer Khrom on your t-shirt? So identifying as Khmer Khrom, like, it is, it is an issue for us in our homeland. So that's why, another reason why I think it's really important for us uh, to identify ourselves here because we have the chance, the opportunity to say, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're a people that's, you know, that's out here, you know, that exists. We're not just some people that Vietnam keeps claiming doesn't exist year after year. And if, you know, Vietnam keeps claiming us, uh, the Khmer Khrom people, like there's no indigenous people year after year since we joined the UN, uh, permanent form of indigenous people. Every time we made an intervention, they said, oh, there's no indigenous people. So how can we actually trust that the source, the population data, uh, whether accurate or not, is actually, you know, uh, reflects the true, you know, identification of the people. Um, Okay, so, so Don, aside from the census, um, here in the U.S., as you know, we are just a couple of weeks away from the primary election. So I wanted to see, have you been able to talk to your families and friends within your community to exercise their rights to vote? How have you been able to be helpful as a resource to others when it comes to voting? Yes, so uh, I'm part of the Cambodian Culture Organization here in North Carolina, and one of the activities that we have done uh, is to uh, promote voter uh, education it, all in line with uh, nonprofit work, of course, which means we don't promote any specific uh, agenda, policy platforms, or uh, candidates. But we help people to understand like the importance of voting and why, who, which offices are uh, are open up for for election this year. Um, so actually, we did a phone banking today just to help people remind them that about early election that's going on. Um, and the process of registering, how they can register, how they can register at the booth, how they can uh, before before the uh, the uh, registration was closed. We help. Uh, we set up uh, different events to help people register in our community. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things that I've been able to fortunately help our community with, and those are some of the also main distinctions between uh, our life here, our work here as nonprofits, and our work, uh, potential works in Kampuchea Grom or South Vietnam or Vietnam, as you say today, because 
where we are, where our people are, those there's no nonprofit organizations, there's no NGOs that actually go out and educate people on these issues uh, like that, like we do here. Uh, so, so again, like I said, because because we are able to do it, because it gives our people power, voice, representation, uh, it's. It's something that we shouldn't take lightly. It's something we shouldn't take for granted. Just because knowing that that is some of the uh, basics that we don't even have, the fundamental freedoms that we don't even have in in Kamchatka Grom. I mean, the election there, they do have elections in Vietnam, but it's it's not you know it's not the same where people are informed, educated, and uh, the process are open and transparent. So I would say for those who don't have the resources, um, kind of like nonprofits that you work for that, that help to educate and kind of guide and help people you know, in your community, um, what do you think that it's the best avenue for people to get the information they need if they're not sure who to vote for or what to vote for? Um, I mean, you know, obviously there's online and, and everything there. So what do you think is the best for people to do to take the next steps in voting and um, where do they get the information? That I guess that's the biggest you know, question for you. Right. So, like you said, the information is is online, um, and the information are being bombarded to us every day by these different candidates. Um, one of the places online you can go to is so like ballotopedia.com. Uh, uh, um, I can send you out those resources that you can put, uh, share later. But these candidates are also on social media, like we are, and so uh, you can actually find. Uh, their their websites and what platforms they're running on, what issues that uh, they prioritize. So you can look at that and you can see what issues you prioritize. You know, as as a as a minority or as an American, whatever you identify, and see what issues speaks most to you, and then you can vote based on that. Uh, so that's that's how we approach things. We you know we tell them like uh, you know these are the resources that are available. You can. You, know, you can go to here. You can read out these reviews, reviews by other different nonprofit organizations, uh, such as Democracy Now. They have uh, reviews of different um, uh, candidates and their platforms, and their uh, questionnaires, questionnaires of what you know, what issues matter, and how they they answer those those issues. And then, based on that, uh, our community members can make their own decision, an informed decision. So Don, in the end, we are in a mission to represent the Khmer Krom peoples, may it be in Kampuchea Krom or anywhere in the world. I mean, you have touched up on this on you know a couple of the questions that I just asked you that we've been talking about. Um, other than what you've stated, why do you think that it's crucial to participate in the primary election this upcoming month? What, is there anything else you would like to add that you didn't mention in the earlier responses? I think the most important thing that we should, you know, consider as Macron people is that uh, today we live in America. Uh, the Macron people in America, we live in a society that values democracy, values um, uh, participation, involvement by uh, the people, the citizen, and that's not to be taken lightly when. Uh, millions of our people back home don't share, you know, the same the same kind of luxury and freedom that, that we have. So uh, in exercising you know, the right to vote, you're exercising your, you know, your power to be represented, your power to have a voice. Um, so when given a voice, you should always exercise it. If you're not at a table, then you don't have a share of you know, your say. And if you're not part of the planning, somebody else is planning for you, and which is the case in you know, our lives in Kapcha Grom. So it's really important that our community uh, take, you know, their their uh, kind of their future in in a way and to their hand by exercising the right to vote and helping to shape the future of their community, of their country, wherever they might be. Um, so. Yeah, in the end, I, I would I would say that um, you you should always exercise your right to speak. Um, you should never be silent when you know when you're given the the power. And if you're not given the power, you should stand above that and you know demand it because uh, freedom is an important fundamental part of you know having 
the ability to live a fruitful and meaningful life. So, yeah, sometimes, sometimes uh, in order to to like to speak about to speak about justice, to speak about uh, human rights, we have to kind of disturb peace a little. Disturb peace meaning, you know, speaking about things that the status quo are comfortable with and that might get you in trouble and such such as uh, the situation of our many many of our human rights advocates back home you know they speak about uh, uh, rights of indigenous people rights of uh, our people to preserve our culture to preserve our natural resources our land and such and they become you know persecuted because of that and so even more important now for us to be able to exercise all these rights when we're in when we're in an environment where, you know, we're given these uh, freedoms without without the fear of persecution. Um, so yeah, get out there and go vote and make your voice uh, known and also complete your census if you, well it's too late now to complete your census. But I hope you all did complete your census and make uh, the world know that Khmer Krom people exist. And uh, I, I think that boat has sailed now because uh, we all know Khmer Krom exists now, but back uh, about a decade or two ago, it was really hard to find anything about Khmer Krom. But now, you know, Khmer Krom is everywhere on the internet, at the UN, so uh, it's, a, it's really great to be part of an organization such as the Khmer Krom Federation that has you know, gone from uh, like zero recognition for our organization to global recognition for our people. So. Yeah, thank you again for inviting me to be part of this program, and uh, I hope I've been able to share uh, cool experiences with you, and I hope we'll be able to have more cool experiences in the future and share you know, this advocacy work that we continue to do for our people back home. Yeah, thank you, Don. So once again, I wanted to thank you. Um, everything that you've mentioned has been beneficial, informative, and I hope that our viewers, you know, will kind of go in your footsteps and kind of follow, you know, what your work and everything that you do, because you definitely have made a big impact to our community, to KKFYC, and we all definitely appreciate all the work that you do for us. Um, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be part of this group. My honor, actually. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Don. It is amazing to see how Don can manage his full-time job and also be an activist to help KKF advocate for the fundamental rights of the Khmer Krom and for his local community. His dedication is a role model for our Khmer Krom youths. Based on my conversation with Don, I would like to reiterate to the current situation of our Khmer Krom in Kampuchea Krom. Based on the information that KKF received regarding the census that Vietnam conducted in 2019, there were so many Khmer Krom families that were excluded from the census for a couple of reasons. First of all, most of the Khmer Krom are farmers and live in rural areas, so they did not receive any information about the census. Some Khmer Krom families voiced that the government census officers did ask questions although left and failed without showing them how their information was recorded. The Khmer Krom people, in fact, did not see the census form and, from my understanding, the census forms are presented in only Vietnamese. There is no official form in the Khmer language. The census had concluded for more than a year, but the actual total number of how many Khmer Krom in Kampuchea Krom has still not been publicly announced by the government although they just wrote in a press release stating almost the same number of Khmer Krom for the past 30 years. Because the Khmer Krom are being treated as a second citizen in Vietnam, that is why in the Khmer Krom's document, some Khmer Krom are being identified as kin, the ethnic Vietnamese in Vietnam. Even some of the Khmer Krom Buddhist monks have the religion as Kong, meaning no religion, just like the Vietnamese communist members who don't have a religion. Vietnam ratified the ICCPR, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in 1982 with the United Nations as a member state. But Vietnam has not implemented Article 25B, 
every citizen shall have the right and the opportunity without any of the distinctions mentioned in Article 2 and without unreasonable restrictions to vote and to be elected at genuine periodic elections which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret ballot guaranteeing the free expression of the will of the electors. The main reason that Vietnam does not allow people to have the freedom to vote is because Vietnam is a one-party communist state. Even the Kinh, Vietnamese, people don't have the right to vote, so it is obvious that the indigenous peoples, especially the Khmer Krom, have never been able to go to the voting poll because the election in Vietnam is just a showcase. For example, Vietnam is preparing for two elections in 2021. The 13th CPV, Communist Party of Vietnam, in January, and the 14th National General Election in May. The CPV election is to elect the four pillars, which are the party secretary general, the state president, the prime minister, and the chairperson of the National Assembly. These elite positions are not allowed by the Vietnamese citizen to elect, but by negotiation and decision of the top communist leaders. The CPV election doesn't happen yet, but the people in Vietnam already know who will be held in those four positions. Vietnam o always propagates that the members of the National Assembly are elected by the people, but in reality, the normal people like the Khmer Krom have no voice in the election. Because the Vietnamese communist leaders want to protect, project its own party and select only their own relatives and supporters that lead the unstoppable corruptions in Vietnam. The people who have the most impact in the corruption are the people who have no voice, like the indigenous peoples. It is time for me to conclude for this video, and hopefully one day, the people in Vietnam, especially the Khmer Krom, have the right to self-determination, as stated in Article 1 of the ICCPR, to freely decide to vote for who will be their leaders in a free and fair election. Thank you again for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. So, Akun, Jom Thank you.